Hi, I'm Councilman Mark Cuthbertson. I'm here today with uh, members of our opioid task force and mental health professionals to talk about navigating the holidays this year and how to cope with the stress of the pandemic. Um, it's especially important, I think, and we'll talk about this today, that during COVID-19, we recognize the connection between substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, isolating can be hard, homeschooling can be hard, um, and we are out of our routines, and that certainly contributes um, to things. And trying to keep a sense of normalcy as all of our schedules are interrupted due to closings and hybrid school schedules, parents working from home and just living in general during COVID is difficult. Um, but with the holidays around the corner and just having experienced uh, an extraordinary Thanksgiving where if we were abiding by uh, state regulations, we didn't get together with as many of our friends and family as we might have uh, normally. So I, they, I, I found that to be out of the ordinary and stressful. And, and I know that, that, that Christmas is going to be even more difficult. And we've seen, and I've heard unfortunate stories of friends and family um, who have lost loved ones to, uh, to, to overdose during this time period, uh, due in large part to the isolation that has come uh, and the lack of normalcy and the lack of schedule that has come with all of this. So I, I look forward to hearing from our panel of experts. I mean, the, 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 I'll just offer these two anecdotes before I introduce our um, panel. A friend of my wife's is a mental health professional, counsels people, and she said to her, um, Michelle, I, I could work t literally 24-7 and not meet the need that is out there. It is so difficult. There are so many people that are hurting. And I just look at it in my own uh, little world. I have a, a son who's a senior in high school. And I, I saw a New York Times article about, you know, kids and school and remoteness and what this is doing, the stress that it alone that it's putting on the lives of teenagers, um, lest we not look at the rest of the population that obviously this stresses, but the, how, how different a world we live in and, and how it, it really is having an impact on uh, the mental health of uh, those around us. And then in turn, how do we deal with that? Do our people self-medicating or they're abusing substances? So we have a terrific panel and I've said more than enough. So I want to introduce them. Uh, first, uh, chair of our, our panel, Jeffrey Reynolds, uh, who is uh, president and CEO of the Family and Children's Association. I'm sorry, he's the co-chair uh, of our Town of Huntington Opioid Task Force. He co-chairs that with Mary Silverstein, who is the division director for integrated counseling and recovery services for CN guidance and counseling services. And they've, they've done a marvelous job co-chairing this and, and suggesting today's format. Uh, our friend uh, who's always there uh, right at the ready for us, uh, Anthony Ferrandino, who's drug and alcohol counseling uh, work is at the uh, Northport East Northport Union Free School District. Um, Nicole Sullivan uh, also joins us, who is a private practitioner uh, affiliated with Adelphi University Institute for Adolescent Trauma Treatment and Training. Uh, and she's an adjunct professor at two colleges. And last but certainly not least, a dear friend who has served so many in the world of uh, addiction and uh, as a spiritual advisor, he's just a great friend and we want to plug his book. Um, he's the author of a recent book, uh, Saint and a Sinner, The Rise and Fall of a Beloved Catholic Priest and a beloved Catholic priest he certainly is, a recovery specialist and a man who has worked on the stuff, uh, um, on 12 step programs for uh, almost 20 years. I just want to make sure people put that that book on their holiday list. It's trending on Amazon, I can see. So we need to sell a lot more of those books. So let me kick it off with uh, Dr. Jeff Reynolds. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, I appreciate the uh, intro. I'm sure Stephen appreciates the plug. I see he's got the book propped up behind him like every commentator does on the major networks. And so we've got this <laughs> down. You know, look, we're hoping to have a, um, a very thoughtful conversation here today and give to give some folks some tips 
you know, Mark, I do want to thank you and, and also to Michelle, your assistant, for, for helping us kind of launch this process and really supporting the task force from day one and having the vision to put the task force together. The task force came together pre-COVID uh, in response to the opioid crisis impacting Long Island and the town of Huntington was, was down in front of that. And so that served us well that we did those years worth of work up front. So now that as COVID happens and the overdose numbers increase, and we began to see the mental health fallout associated with COVID that we're in a position to respond and respond effectively. The goal of this today is really to give Town of Huntington residents a few ideas and thoughts and tips for how to manage the holiday season. As you noted, it's typically a stressful time of year for many families and individuals, particularly those who struggle with mental health conditions and substance use disorders. But this year is like no other. And so the stress and anxiety and uncertainty that we've seen um, during COVID is likely to ramp up over the course of the winter months. And while we hold a lot of hope for a vaccine and some other breakthroughs in 2021, we know that we've got a little ways to go before we get there. And so in choosing the panelists today, um, they're all folks that have uh, expertise in, um, in social work, in substance use disorders and mental health and supporting kids and families through difficult times. And so I want to get right to the tips because we do have a somewhat of a limited time. The format doesn't necessarily lend itself to the kind of conversation we might have if we were all sitting in a studio or sitting around um, on couches, but I think we'll be able to achieve some of that anyway. But Nicole, I actually want to start out with, with you and, and ask you to talk a little bit about um, some strategies that you think families could use to manage stress and anxiety, both in themselves as well as in their kids. Um, and how do you keep yourself healthy and strong during the holidays? Thanks, Jeff. I'm happy to be here today. And so I'll, I'll start off by saying that, you know, the tips may be simple, but not easy. Um, and so when we talk about COVID and the impact that it's having, as, as Mark said earlier, you know, myself and, and my colleagues could work 24 seven. Um, the need is just so great. So for folks throughout the holiday season, you know, I think about my patients where the holidays can normally be a difficult time um, because of the idea that we're supposed to be happy and we're supposed to be joyful and we're supposed to be in a holiday spirit. Um, but unfortunately this year with COVID, for a lot of people, it's difficult um, to be happy through the holiday season. And so I'll start off with saying, you know, boundaries are really, really important um, for people that will be visiting with family and friends or their immediate um, household. If folks are feeling dysregulated, if they're feeling stressful, if they're feeling anxiety ridden, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to set a start time and an end time. And it's okay to excuse yourself from the environment if you feel you need to do so. Um, you know, most kids today have access to a smartphone um, or an Apple Watch or a Samsung smartwatch. Um, these things are really great tools in checking um, someone's heart rate. And so often periodically what I encourage my patients to do throughout the day um, is just check in with their body check in with how they're feeling, right? And so when we're feeling stressed and we're feeling anxious, um, the iPhone, the Samsung, the smartwatch, right? You'll get an elevated heart rate often, right? As your body begins to release these stress hormones. And so when your heart rate is elevated or your smartwatch goes off and tells you that it's elevated, it's a good time to take a break. Um, the other thing that I will say in terms of that Movement and exercise is really one of the most powerful, useful tools in managing stress and anxiety, daily movement. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, 15 minutes yoga um, is really helpful for my folks that don't like strenuous exercise, but it helps the body prime itself for dealing with stress and anxiety. So um, I know a lot of us are working from home, managing a lot of different things, you know, even if you just take 15 minutes out of the day to get up and do some really light movement um, or a walk around the block outside, although New York winters sometimes don't lend itself to that, a little bit of daily movement is helpful. Start time and end times, if you are going to be visiting with family and friends and sometimes find those family and friends to be a little bit triggering. Um, and checking in with yourself throughout the day, I think is really important. 
Um, and so, you know, the wonderful thing about technology, just like we can all meet today, um, it will also allow you to check in with yourself. So um, mostly everyone I know has access to a smartphone. You know, you just put your finger on it. It'll tell you your pulse a couple of times a day. And if it's elevated, you know, do some light movement, set a boundary with family or friends, take a break if you need to. And the last thing I'll say um, with stress and anxiety for some people, um, aromatherapy or even um, like lavender or eucalyptus, you know, they make like roll-ons um, that you can kind of just like roll on your wrist or your neck. Um, and, you know, naturally it is a really natural way to help the body kind of regulate and calm down a little bit. Um, Amazon sells everything these days. You can check that out online and um, know that despite it being a crazy wild 10 months, the holidays will end. We will get through this. Um, and there are mental health professionals that are available to help you. So reach out if you need the help. Simple, simple, but not easy. Awesome. You know, thank you, Nicole. You know, one of the things you, you said, I liked everything you said, but especially the discussion about uh, phones and media and social media and that kind of thing. And, you know, we're lucky to have Anthony with us today. And there's no one that loves social media more than young people. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about the impact of, of devices on the developing brain. But Anthony, you know, you work with kids every single day and, and in a school setting, which has become a blur between home and actually what's happening in, in classrooms. Can you talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about how you know, parents and kids can work together to reduce the overall stress and, and navigate really difficult times? Absolutely. And Nicole, you said so many good things that were so many of the things that are on my list too, which is, I think, like you said, I loved, I loved how you started it. These things are simple to say, but sometimes hard to do. But, you know, I think as a, as a family and as a parent, you know, one of your responsibilities in protecting and safeguarding our kids is being able to filter out the negative influences that are coming into their world. Right. And we're in this middle of this pandemic now. So what does that mean? You know, maybe, the news, social media, right? If, if you have your, your TV on all day long, listening to the news, repeating itself, that can create a tremendous amount of stress and add to and enhance to the already stressful time that we're in. Even if it's in the background, you might not be paying attention, but your kids are hearing that. You know, um, you talked about family already and setting boundaries with family that might be toxic. There's also other family stuff. There might be family news that comes out. Maybe somebody passes to it due to an overdose or COVID. So it's important to figure out how to have those conversations and not allow our, our kids to get that information secondhand, that they're getting it from you. They're getting that information from you ahead of time. And if we filter that stuff out, what are we going to filter in? We want to filter in some more positive stuff. We want to filter in positive activities. Uh, Jeff mentioned so you know social media, and I think I love the suggestions with the heart rate and and using the phone. But then I also think that it's important for our kids to unplug a bit. And yeah, it's a little cold outside. Dress warm and get out there. Yeah. Take a brisk yeah. walk, and yeah. and do it together as a family. Like and have your kids create some of those activities. Get together and say, what are we going to do today? Let them pick some. You pick some, and you know work together to get through this season to reduce that stress. We always talk about self-care strategies. They could be very simple, right? It's, uh, I say, eat, sleep, uh, hydrate, and breathe. Those are the things that we need to live, right? So make sure your kids are having enough water. Make sure they're drinking enough water. Make sure they're getting enough nutritious food. Make sure they're getting adequate sleep. I think a lot of teenagers get more than adequate sleep, a lot, a lot of my kids. And that would be the flip side of this. Make sure they're not in bed all day long and isolating, right? And family activities can create laughter. Laughter can help reduce stress. It doesn't always have, we don't always have to talk about it to reduce it. Sometimes we just need to get together and have fun, play a game, do an activity, but social connection amongst positive people in your life is what we need to find those opportunities and, and create them and, and create genuine social connection. And if it's just your immediate family and it's you and your two kids, Maybe it's an opportunity to give back, to, to, to start a gratitude practice, you know, talk about what you're grateful for. Maybe see if the local food pantry needs a volunteer or donate food. Something simple like that can change, shift perspective and keep our kids 
you know, in a positive mindset. We, we, we have a, 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 we're talking about a very different holiday schedule. Talk to your kids about that ahead of time. Don't wait for the holidays to come and say, oh, by the way, we're not going to Uncle Janet's house, you know, Aunt Janet's house, you know, this year. Talk about what your schedule is going to look like well ahead of time and allow your kids to input as well as allow them to express their frustration and talk about how they're feeling towards it, you know, and that might not come out so nice. They might be upset. They might be angry. Let them vent. Let them vent and let them feel like they're being heard. That's so important. I think when I'm meeting with kids, they just want to be heard. They just want their opinion heard. They want to they want to talk about how they're feeling at that moment. And then they can transition. They're very resilient. They're able to transition. Hey, Anthony, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. And I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot, but one of the yeah. things I've noticed, and as the father of, of a 14-year-old, um, I've seen this in that parents have very different ideas about what's okay in the COVID environment in terms of sleepovers and hanging out at each other's houses. And I think we all kind of recognize the importance of adolescent socialization, yet are forced to balance that with the realities of a, um, of a serious illness and, and, and a pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about how parents might navigate, you know, young people saying, well, so-and-so is doing it and I'm going to get left out and socially I'm going to be at a disadvantage. Then, you know, I'm, yes, I'm protecting myself from COVID, but I'm destroying my social life. I think it's a really tough, co it's coming up a lot. It's coming up a tremendous amount. And I think it's important for our families to establish what their values are and have those conversations about what, our, what is our family value and to, rec to, to get the point across to our kids that safety is paramount, right? Safety is the most important thing. And um, Nicole said it, this is temporary. We'll get through this, we'll transition through this and we'll be able to move on. But I do think that's a very difficult conversation and I think our kids have a very singular motivation when they're talking to us about wanting to go out and wanting to connect. And I think this is where the social media and the other devices actually allow them to continue to connect just as long as they're not using them too much. But um, I think I think understanding what what are your values and not wavering from them at this point in time I think is super important for parents. They're saying this is safety, safety, safety. All right, if a kid was injured, we'd bring them to the doctor. We or we and we would try and prevent injury. We want to safeguard as much as possible. That's awesome. That's great advice. We're really fortunate to have with us today also Stephen Donnelly. Uh, Stephen has been a familiar face around um, Huntington and, and especially the village. And some folks might recall years ago, played a key role in pulling together Long Islanders in a unified way around the escalating overdose crisis here on Long Island. And with, with several hundred people packed into St. Pat's, it really represented one of the key kind of assemblies where Long Islanders became aware of the overdose crisis, were able to hear firsthand from families who have been impacted and really galvanized um, to make some of the progress that we've experienced over the past couple of years. And, and Stephen, you have a gift for bringing folks full circle and, and really centering us in terms of what's important. And, and I'm going to ask you to do some of that here today under really challenging circumstances. How do families find that piece um, how do they make the most of the holidays and how do they learn to value every day? Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a very difficult year, as everybody knows, but for families during this time of holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and different holidays that people celebrate leading into New Year's, this year, 2020, is going to be very much different than any other year before. And I believe that the families need to rally around the person in their lives. Um, who may be suffering from substance abuse or alcoholism. For the alcoholic, which I'm one of, and with the grace of God, many years of recovery, this is a very difficult time. We're in the Bermuda Triangle, which commenced last Wednesday night, uh, Thanksgiving Eve, which is a, probably the second biggest night of the year for drinking, through Thanksgiving weekend, and now in this month of December, we have holiday parties at the office, at schools, wherever we can find, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's. So for the person who's addicted, it's so hard to get through. But as I share with many people who I work with, it's a one day at a time program. I don't look ahead to New Year's Eve. I'm not looking ahead to Christmas Day. All I'm looking ahead for is this afternoon, into this evening, and then the next day. And for addicts and alcoholics, if they could get that into their mind, that it's a one day, one day, let's just get through today. Now, the isolation issue is very difficult because as an addict and alcoholic, 
what do we like to do? We love to isolate. We love to be by themselves. And that's why, and I believe Nicole and Anthony both alluded to this in a sense of the isolation and having space. We need to give people space, but we also need to have that vision to help them in those moments of darkness. Because just as much as each day at this time of the year gets a little bit darker, a little bit darker, so does the life of an addict and alcoholic. But with support, with the support of one another, especially the family members, anything is possible. And for the person who's suffering through substance abuse or alcoholism, reach out. Don't, don't fall into that shell. Don't be by yourself. Reach out. Let people know how you feel. Let them know the difficulties that you're facing. And with the help of another alcoholic, another person in recovery, you can do this. You can do this. Make this holiday season your gift to your family, to your friends, that you're going to attempt, maybe for the third time, maybe for the 30th time. Relapse sometimes is part of our lives, but maybe your gift. Instead of going out and, well, we don't go out to the stores, and instead of going online and shopping, maybe your gift to your family, your friends, your community will be that you're going to try to stay clean and you're going to try to stay sober one day at a time. It would be the greatest gift that you could give to yourself and to your friends and family. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, knew, I knew you could do it. I had no doubt. Um, I want to give, before I turn it over to uh, my esteemed co-chair uh, to kind of take us out, I did want to give Anthony and Nicole a, a, a chance to just say a couple other things. And, and building off some of your comments, Stephen, one of the things we know is that during times of anxiety and stress and uncertainty and, and around COVID, we know that there were very few essential services um, in New York State, but one of them was liquor stores. And with the advent of, of apps, you could actually have alcohol delivered to your home. And whereas before you couldn't walk down the street with an open container, now you can pull your car up to a restaurant and get a 55 gallon drum worth of margaritas loaded into the, the trunk. And, you know, we've seen an increase in wine memes, particularly among moms on social media. And we know that generally alcohol use has increased among adults, which sends a message to kids. Um, you know, I guess my question for, for both Anthony and, and Nicole is, is how do we begin to counter some of those messages as we head into the long term? Um, I think, you know, many families have alcohol as a part of holiday celebrations or have it around the house. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about how we make sure that we're not sending double messages to our kids? I guess Anthony first, and then we'll go to Nicole. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's so important for our parents to act as role models and model the behavior that we want to see our kids do. So, you know, my, this is an opportunity now to model good coping skills or talk about, or at least maybe not reach for that, for, for, for that bottle of wine or, or have a uh, wine Zoom party or whatever else with your friends and maybe um, tell you, you know, say, tell your kids you're going to start a yoga practice or maybe we're going to go out for a walk every day. And I think that's so important. And then connecting it to when I'm frustrated, this is what I'm going to do in place of that now. So our kids realize, okay, when you're stressed, you have a healthy coping mechanism. So role modeling is so important. Cool. Good advice. Nicole? And I think also piggybacking off of that, um, giving children and adolescents the space to talk about things. Um, I'm a college professor and so I have a lot of students, I do teach the addictions course, I have a lot of students who talk about, you know, my my parents say don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, and so if we're not really modeling good behavior, we it's really hard to have the expectation that our children are going to be able to do what we'd like them to do, right? So I think it starts with us as adults. Um, I think it, it's also imperative to give a space for them to talk about the way that, that they feel, as Anthony mentioned earlier, you know, the feelings of feeling left out and um, the COVID isolation and trying to balance, as Jeff said, the socialization with, with a really deadly pandemic. Um, but incorporating healthy coping skills as much as you can, modeling healthy behavior, and also knowing that sometimes people don't want to talk. Um, so a family game night, a family walk, um, if they tell you they don't want to talk about it, sometimes that's okay too. That doesn't mean we don't readdress it later, 
but it does mean that we respect their boundaries in those moments where they prefer not to engage. Awesome. Good. Good. Advice. I would say one last thing, um, just that if you think that your kid needs help, reach out and get help. And there's so many resources and don't, don't hesitate on that one. You wouldn't hesitate if they had a fever to bring them to the doctor, reach out and find a, a good therapist. A good, uh, Town of Huntington has tremendous resources for our youth. Uh, we use them all the time in the school here. They have awesome work, people that work for, for the town that, that can help your kids. So please reach out. Great advice and the perfect uh, segue to uh, reintroducing uh, the co-chair of the task force, Mary Silberstein, who comes from one of those organizations, CN Guidance and Counseling Services, um, that is one of those community resources out there uh, helping folks uh, left and right. So Mary, did you want to say a few words and you know, maybe talk a little bit about and, and reinforce the need for folks to get help and the fact that it is out there? Yes. Um, I think you all said it very beautifully and, and really uh, stole my thunder in some ways, but that's okay. You know, the, uh, we, we really hope that uh, people are able to watch this and walk away with some really good insight in how to handle or, or deal with what's going on. It's, it's so hard right now, what we're all experiencing. And it's all, as, as we all know, it's a, it's a new normal and certainly being able to deal with uh, the holidays and the impact of COVID-19 on all of our lives is, is very important to know on how to, how to deal with it, how to get through it. You know, as what was already said, it's so important to get the support, it's so important to get the insight and, and know that you are not alone, that you don't have to isolate. Um, as, as was, as Anthony said, you know, really knowing resources is an important piece, knowing just like if your child had a fever, you would go to the doctor. If you're having issues that you're struggling with, there are folks that you can reach out to. Um, following this, this video presentation, we have a list of referrals along with a hotline number that you can access. And we really encourage you to take a look at it. And, and certainly if you, need any information, um, please, if the, if the resource list is too much to kind of look at it as a whole, look at, le at least at the hotline number and give that a call. We, we so appreciate you, you watching this and, and hope that it, it really helps you. Um, and I thank you again. And I thank everybody on the panel for joining us today. Mark. Yeah, you so thank you, Mary. This has been, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. That's um, this has been uh, this has been great, and you know, as, as both you and Anthony emphasized, there are lots of resources um, in the town of Huntington, uh, ready, willing, and able to provide assistance. We're, we're blessed to have those resources in the town, and blessed to have elected officials like Mark Cuthbertson. So, um, Mark, I'm going to hand it back to you to wish everybody a very happy holiday. I do want to say thank you to uh, to our panelists, Stephen. Uh, Anthony, Nicole, and of course, uh, Mary, I want to thank you for uh, co-chairing with me and for your uh, your friendship. Yeah, thank, thank you all to the panelists and, and a uh, happy and blessed holiday. I, I think just to take off what, what Mary, two points uh, as we close out, you know, it's still, I, I mean, we talk about it in your profession to destigmatize mental health issues is still so critical. So when you look around, in, in this pandemic, um, all the more important, all the more important around the holidays that if, if someone you know is, is suffering, get them help. Let's do away with this stigma that has burdened us as a society for far too long. And Nicole, uh, Anthony, and all of you, Stephen, what great and simple tips. My son is working on his high school senior quote for the yearbook, and he his quote is going to be, if fishing was easy, they'd call it catching, right? And I think that's what the point was with your tips, Nicole, which is, you know, the, the tips can be simple, but they're not easy. Stephen, the one day at a time, and Anthony, taking ourselves away from social media and all the things that we face, they're, they're simple, but they certainly are not easy. So maybe we can do some of that hard work and make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others. And I can't thank all of you enough for being a part of this. Uh, hopefully we'll get it out to as many people as 
possible. We tried to keep it short and sweet. I think that was part of uh, Jeff and, and Mary's mission. So thank you all for, for your all that you do in this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.